All right. Um, first, I want to introduce one of our first panelists, Ms. Elise Hill. She is a board certified genealogist with 20 years of research experience and a specialization in African American research. She recently completed several research projects involving formerly enslaved individuals that had connections to the University of Georgia, Antioch AME Church in Stone Mountain, and the TRR Cobb House and Museum in Athens. Her passion is to assist those with an interest and desire to learn about their ancestors and families' histories. We will also today be hearing from Miss Laura Carter. Laura Carter worked at the Athens Clark County Library almost continuously from July of 1974 until she partially retired in July 31st, 2001, 2012, excuse me. She retired completely by the end of 2014. Her passion is reference librarianship and archives, especially genealogy reference and teaching folks how to use library resources. She has a master's degree in instructional technology, a master's degree in library and information sciences, and a special degree in library and information sciences with a specialty in archives and manuscripts. During her years in the athens Clark County Heritage Room, she taught classes on genealogy, library resources, and has continued this since retirement. She has attended the IGHR, or Institute of Genealogy and Historical Research, formerly at Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama, now here based in Athens, Georgia, to hone her genealogical knowledge along with national conferences of the National Gene Genealogical Society, Federation of Genealogical Societies, and Roots Tech. She's a member of multiple genealogical, historical, and professional societies and organizations. So ladies, if you want to go ahead and, oh, hang on, I'm going out of order today. I'm gonna let Frida introduce our other two panelists who will be joining us today, and then we will go ahead and get started. Thank you, Frida. Dr. Giles, you're muted. Everybody, I always do that, okay? It ha every time. Uh, I was saying that we're very honored to have two experts in uh, genealogical research, uh, both through uh, education and experience with us on the panel today. Uh, first, uh, we have Mary Roberts Bailey, who uh, is originally from Athens. She grew up in Athens and her family, the Roberts family, was the second family to move to the plaza area. Her parents were both educators. Her mother taught at Reese Street, then at West Broad, and another school, uh, and then uh, at Fowler. Her father taught math at Athens High and Industrial and after integration was assigned to Clark Central. Mary lived in Athens for a while uh, caring for her mother, but now she comes to us all the way from Syracuse, New York, which by the way is where I grew up. Uh, so uh, she, her family is a Georgia family who she has extensively researched and is going to tell us more about. Uh, the next panelist is Dr. Merrill Penson, who served as executive director of libraries uh, for the University System of Georgia for a number of years. Uh, Dr. Penson has been an extremely valuable asset to our Asala Athens branch, and she is going to uh, assist us in, more in the area of genealogical research. Now, neither of these ladies, I haven't even touched on their accomplishments uh, because I want to give them the time to do what we've asked them to do, but we are very honored to have them both uh, speaking today. So those are the introductions. I'm going to hand it back over to uh, the panel uh, according to my program. Uh, Ms. Elise Hill 
will get us started, followed by Ms. Carter, Dr. Penson, and Ms. Bailey, and followed by Q&A. So without further ado, uh, Ms. Hill, will you please open the program? Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And good afternoon, everybody. First of all, can everyone hear me? I didn't do a sound check before. I didn't even think about that. So hopefully, you thank you. And also somebody keep me on track because I'll, I'll go on and on and on and forgetting we, I got 15 minutes. So I'd appreciate that. So I'm going to talk about the very first steps in, in doing genealogy research. So I do what's called kind of, if you think of, like jumper cables to get everybody kicked off and where to start, because usually that's the hardest part in beginning is where do I begin? So whether it's African-American genealogy or any kind of genealogy research, where do I start? So the first item you need to know is you need to start with yourself. Count yourself, you're, you're the very first one, and then you're gonna go back and map out parents, grandparents, and those, and those generations going, going further back. In addition to that, you want to start gathering documents and documents, marriage records, death records, newspaper articles, pictures, um, military records of, of, you know, the family members that you're going to be doing research on. So you want to start um, gathering documents. You also want to start interviewing family members, especially those older family members. You want to um, talk to as many people as you can and don't discount a family member thinking, I know in my family, I had older cousins that will say, well, talk to me because my sister don't remember, you know, this, that, and the other. And I talked to the sister and she knew more than the others, you know, so just talk to everybody that you can. <laughs> don't, don't try to just pick out certain ones. And in addition to family members, also interview friends of the family and neighbors of family members, especially ones that can speak for those that have passed on. You know, a lot of times neighbors have information, friends of your ancestors have information as well as documents, pictures, maybe diaries, letters. So do the rounds of doing your interviewing and gathering your documents. Photos, if you can, if at all possible, try to identify the people, the place and the year. I mean, I have some wonderful old photos and somebody said it's somebody and I don't know who it is or where it was or what date or whatever. Now, you know, obviously a lot of the older pictures we're not able to do that, but as much as you can. And again, in talking with people, just say, hey, I have this picture. Do you know who this is? Do you have about the, the year range it was taken and the location? And in doing all that, when you get your interviews and your documents together, create an inventory of what you have. You can just get a spreadsheet, you can get a Microsoft Word document and start putting down picture from 1930, um, Starkville, Mississippi grandparents. Um, and you can, even if you want to number the documents, you can do it that way, just so you kind of have an organized way of being able to go back to your documents and cite your sources. Now, they don't have to be as formal as, um, like I had to do for my certification. I, you know, it had, it had to be a certain way. And sometimes they were six sentences long. They were longer than a paragraph sometimes, citation. Just put, as long as you can put enough information in there where you or somebody else can go back and find what you're talking about, that's what's important. And I learned that the hard way in my own research because I didn't do that when I started researching. And now years later, I look at something, I have no clue where I got that information from, what page number it was on. And so that's just very important to cite, always, always, always cite your sources. And save your inventory and your documents, if, if, preferably in the cloud, because as we know, computers can crash and thumb drives can, can get messed up. But if that's all you have right now, then at the least back up, back up your information. There's nothing more heartbreaking to have hundreds of pieces of information, found information in your computer crashes and it's all gone. You know, I, I don't, that's just the worst nightmare I can envision for, well, one of the worst in researching. So. Preferably cloud-based backups, but if not, um, 
just even if you just back up in a thumb drive to something other than your computer. So try to do that. Also, educate yourself as much as you can. Um, there are lots of webinars and YouTube videos, and there is so much online for self-education. And, and especially in these days that we're in a virtual learning that you would just be amazed. Uh, the National Archives, they have all kinds of video. They even have videos from previous conferences they had like five, six years ago. So, so take a certain amount of time out of the week to do some self-education on genealogy research, beginning genealogy research, as well as specific records. So for example, a specific records and subjects. So for example, African-American research, census records, military records, land records. Um, there's virtual conferences. The, a lot of the national conferences now are virtual and also a lot of the institutes are virtual. So take advantage of that. But at some point you will really need to, I know all of, most of us did self-learning or, or you do self-learning in beginning genealogy, but you really need to educate yourself as much as you can from others, from learning from others. Also educate yourself on research methodology. So for example, fan club research, looking outside of your specific person you're looking for, looking at those neighbors, looking at those friends, looking at instead of just your grandfather, his brother or his sister, sometimes you have to go outside of your main area or person of research to get back in to the information that you need. Resolving conflicting information. Um, if you see that someone in a record it says they were born in 1910 in New York and another record you say, see they were born in 1905 in New Jersey. What, what else can you do to try to, to pinpoint that to find out what the conflict is? You at least have to make an effort. Sometimes you may not ever know, but you at least need to make the effort and you need to write that up. Of, um, I saw this person says they were born in New York on a birth certificate, but a death certificate says New Jersey, but who was the informants and, and when did the informant give the information and all that kind of information. So you have to kind of do analysis, improving your conclusions. Is it enough to say that you see somebody in a census record and it says that they, um, let's say, were a doctor? Is that enough? You know, no, you need to look for other records and to prove your point, to prove what you're, what you're saying. You always need to do that. So that's all called methodology. So that's something else you need to um, just try to take lessons on and learn how to do. And educate yourself on historic events, obviously um, Civil War, World War I, Reconstruction, African-American migration, all, all these different events that will have something to do at a timeline within your research, not have something to do, but will be involved in the timeline of your research. And also learning about the three levels of government, local, state, and federal. There's all kinds of different records for these different levels that are, that are quite different because there were different laws that affected those. So you need to learn about that. And then you need to get into the areas that you're going to be doing research in. So for example, there, your state records, you need to learn the different laws and things that affected within that state because state laws are all different, right? Um, what goes for Georgia may not go in Colorado, for example. So you need to know that. And you also need to know for the time period you're doing research in. So research of people's living in the states in 1940, those laws were much different than in, let's say, 1880s. So educate yourself on that. Keep in mind that, like I said, all states are different and even regions are different. So within the Southern region, there's different laws and records for Georgia than let's say in Florida or Mississippi or Tennessee. So keep that in mind as, and also with counties in Georgia, Henry County had different records than Hall County. Some have a whole lot more, some have a whole lot less. Then you're dealing with the issue with burn counties, which was mostly during the Civil War. There's some that don't even have records that exist during 
certain periods of time. So educate yourself on the area of your research. Also, good resources for that are your state and local genealogical and historical societies. Look into what they have online. Look into being a member. Sometimes member benefits, they have different newsletters, um, different discounted things for classes and conferences and things like that. State archives are excellent resources. They, um, especially for, for county records. So for example, the Georgia State Archives has a, a lot of county records on microfilm. And if you live near the Georgia Archives, obviously that's much better and more convenient to go there versus having to go to South Georgia, somewhere to a courthouse. Sometimes you don't have any choice, but learn the, the, the inventory of what type of records the state archives have. And then you want to also you, what you want to do is you want to analyze the information you found out about ancestry and the possible interactions they had with different government or state facilities. So for an example, if you see an ancestor that was a farmer, think about in the state he and she he or she was in, what type of federal programs or records were are available that related to farmers. Of business owners, did they have to get business licenses? If so, where are those licenses at? What was required? Do they still exist? If you had someone, doctors or dentists, professional type occupations, you have colleges, that automatically tells you right there you need to look at what colleges they possibly went to, what resources those colleges have. So again, this is all you want to keep track of in notes of your documents as you're looking at these different ancestors and um, putting the information together. And, and these are things too that can be things to do, I'm not saying you're gonna be able to do all these things at one time, but again, in your documentation, have your things to do list. I, I need to educate myself more on, on Alabama. I need to look at their state archives website to see what records are available and things like that. So also, familiarize yourself with those local records such as funeral homes and churches. Um, funeral home records, and, and a lot of people, you, you just be surprised. I know I'm doing research now for an individual from Columbus, Georgia, and um, that client had a ancestor that died in the, in the funeral home is still in existence. And so I called that funeral home to ask if they had records on this person um, that they took in. This was like in 1930 something, and they did. They have records, believe it or not. And so I, I just took a chance and said, I called them and see. And so they're gonna get the records and make copies and, and mail to me. And it, and it varies what they might have. It may be um, an application or whatever the family members had to do to have the funeral and, and services and things like that. But again, these are all things that provide genealogical information as well as family information. This is just overall family knowledge of an ancestor. And also keep in mind that you not only want to look at African American churches, you also want to look at those local uh, majority white churches because you did have African Americans even during slavery that were members of white churches before they created their own or sometimes they never were able to form their own church. But um, you also want to keep um, all churches in mind to look at um, records. And like I said, not just African-American. So once you start um, getting your education together and get your documents together and you're ready to actually start, your first record of research is going to be the census records. And that's because of all the information they provide. And there's all kind of trainings on that and the strategies and and what kind of information you can get from that. Right now, 1940 is the latest that's open to the public. So if you were born 1940 or before, you should be able to find yourself. And if not, you should at least be able to find your parents. And, and like I said, it, it, it's a whole um, strategy and instructions of how to do it. But just so you know, the census records are your first record of research. They um, family search, um, website has them, that's a free, a free website that you can um, search census records on. And of course, Ancestry has them, and then that's a paid subscription. 
Ms. Hill, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ms. Hill, but uh, you have about one minute left. Oh, really? Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Time goes by fast. So, okay. Yeah. So, so I'll just conclude with that and also to just keep in mind that when you start your research, everybody's not going to have that Alex Haley um, moment, that finding your roots moment, that who you think you are moment, especially in African American research is a very challenging research, not to say you won't, but don't expect that, you know, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be able to write my book, you know, like Alex Haley did of everything you found. So just know that it's a lot of challenges, but with education, you can learn you know, how to overcome those brick walls. And also DNA is not the answer to all the re research. DNA is a part of research. Just because you take DNA, it's not going to give you all the answers. You have to include research with it. So, okay, thank you. I to <laughs> well, thank you for getting to started. <laughs> There's a lot of fantastic information. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we will be back to you in the Q&A. And uh, so now may we please hear from Laura Carter, Ms. Carter. Hi, everybody. I want to reiterate what, what um, Elise said. We worked up a long list of topics we needed to cover in this 30 minutes, because we're trying to cover in 30 minutes what normally you do in eight hours. So that's why we provided a resource list for y'all to look at that should give you the detailed information you know, that we're just hitting the high spots of. I also want to reiterate that the TV shows make it look really easy. It drives us all crazy because they act like you just go and you find this stuff and it's all clear cut and it doesn't work that way in any kind of genealogy. I'm just saying. Okay. As Elise said, it is critically important to understand the time and place um, that your ancestors were living in because this is the how you figure out what they were doing, why they were doing it so that you can get to what you really need to know about them. So you can figure out how they interacted with their fan club, friends, associates, neighbors, and the local government. Learn to leverage the free resources as much as possible like Cindy's list, familysearch.org. We put some of these on your resource list. Lots of people in the same place at the same time. Oh, I guess I forgot to share my screen. Not that y'all really need to look at me, but anyway. Oh, well, we won't worry about that. Um, lots of people have the same names. So just because you find somebody with the same name, you've got to do a lot more analysis and evaluation than you know you think you do the other thing that makes it really difficult for african-american research particularly after slavery is that a lot of siblings pick different surnames and later they would change those surnames so just because you know one brother picked this that or the other and the other one picked something else and the sister picked something else and the parents picked something else doesn't mean that everybody did so this makes it hard there are a lot of instances in this if you look at the freedman's bank records you can see where they'll talk about their siblings you know their parents and what their first and name last name were were and stuff so you gotta be flexible with names another thing key principle in genealogy is that spelling is irrelevant particularly when it comes to names just get over the idea that spelling is supposed to be one way. Research in methodology is essentially the same back to 1865 for African American and other ethnic research. You pay, everybody works from what they know about their ancestor and the time and place they were living and use that information. And in even broader strokes, research methodology is the same for everybody in all time periods. You work from what you know, you need to understand the time and place they were in. And based on what little you've been able to glean about your ancestors, you use that information to make intelligent guesses about what other records might have been created. 
Now, for uh, African Americans, you need to be aware of the slave codes. They were different in each colony. They were different in each state. Um, free persons of color, even during the uh, period of enslavement, were different from one place to another, and they were enforced differently from one county to the next, even though the state laws may have said one thing, they weren't necessarily enforced the same way. And after the Civil War, you know, right as Reconstruction ended, they start it developing black codes. You can find really good information about a lot of these online at various repositories and in the family search wiki. So learn to use these free resources. And of course, as time progressed, they became the Jim Crow laws. So I'm just saying that is one of the principal differences you have to be aware of in African American research. Keep in mind, every state is like a different country. But even within states, some counties had different records. For instance, we found shareholder, I mean, sharecropper records in Oglethorpe County, and I have never been able to find from the 1880s. I have never been able to find them for Clark, Oconee, you know, other surrounding counties. So evidently the ordinary in o Oglethorpe County, which is next door to us, decided that those needed to be kept. And so they were kept and they're a gold mine for everybody you know, because these people didn't own land, so they aren't going to appear in the land tax records. Use the research guides for the states in which ancestors lived. Um, National Genealogical Society is doing a series called Research in the States, and they haven't got all 50 states done yet. Um, and they're also doing places like the District of Columbia because it's like a world unto itself. So just look for those guides. The Family Search Wiki has really good information for every state that can get you started. It talks about when it's founded. You know, it will talk about county formation, all of this kind of stuff, which is important. Genealogies have counties like the people do. and unfortunately if you don't know that genealogy you aren't going to be looking in the right place for your people um the georgia genealogical society for instance has published a guide to research in georgia ngs also has one so if you've got a lot of georgia ancestors i recommend you buy that I also really recommend if you have Georgia ancestors, you buy Paul K. Graham's book uh, about courthouses in Georgia, because as Elise mentioned, there were a lot of fires. And of course, sometimes when you contact a courthouse, they're going to tell you they don't have any old records that Sherman burned them. Well, he did enough damage, but he gets credit for damage in port courthouses that he wasn't within 150 miles of just because the people in that courthouse don't understand the old records and don't want to fool with them or with you. So that's something to keep in mind. The history is critically important. Geography is really important because this is why the migration trails are like they are. You may not be surprised or you may be surprised to learn that many of the routes of present day, the interstate system follows the original animal trails that were then turned into the super highways of their day, which were the migration trails, which were very rugged, maybe six feet wide if you were lucky, you know, rutted, not paved. I mean, these were primitive roadways, but they started out as animal tracks, but most of our super highways, our interstate system follows many of those old routes today. So when you look at maps, you will be surprised. I do really want you to think about church records, both in North and South. I didn't know until recently for sure when I saw examples that there were many black members of quote unquote white churches in, um, the north as well as in the south, particularly in rural areas. Um, 
we've got a church in the next county over called Millstone Creek Baptist Church. And they have like six pages of black members after slavery was o over that were still members of that quote unquote white church. So I'm saying, particularly in rural areas, look to see what was a nearby church of the right denomination, because it may make a huge difference to your research. They, there are lots of tools that can save you time and money. A lot of those are gonna be mentioned in that resource list we sent you. Use your local librarians and pick their brains. Ask, when you walk in, ask them what you need. Tell them the time and place you're looking for your last documented ancestor. Don't give them your life story because all you'll do is what people used to do to me, which is totally confuse me. And then I was useless for 15 minutes till I could get my brain back in gear. Tell them the last documented place and time you have an ancestor and then they can have a concrete place that they can start looking and pulling materials for you to work through. So learn how to ask those questions and don't hesitate. That's what they're paid for. That's what they're there for. That's what they want to do. Um, ask for help. Join your local genealogical society because you're going to find that some of your family members kind of their eyes glaze over. They run when they see you coming when you get into genealogy seriously. Your local genealogy society is your local support group. You can talk about genealogy and records and things like that. And we have one in Athens called the Clark Oconee Genealogical Society. And it costs an exorbitant $15 a year to be a member. So I suggest you join immediately. Um, and consider joining the genealogical and historical societies in the places where your ancestors lived because they often have journals and periodicals that they've been publishing often from the 1800s that are available to members of those groups. So check it out. I want to reiterate as well what genealogy is not something you can pick up and quit learning about because things change constantly. Um, so I'm just saying, you know, you really have to keep learning. And that's fun because you finally learn American history. I thought I knew American history a little bit because I took every history course in high school. I minored in history at the University of Georgia. I've always read history and biography. So I thought I had a basic background in history. When I started doing genealogy, I found out I knew very little history. And African-Americans have been further disadvantaged because we don't teach history well in this country, period, but we really do not teach African-American history well. And so it is a constant learning process and you have to be aware that you don't know what you do not know. And if you keep that in mind when you're doing genealogy, and just be open to learning new things, you will do much, much better and succeed much better. And I've spoken really, really fast trying to get through this in 13 or so minutes. And so Thank I'll you. leave it for Meryl and Mary Roberts. Thank you, Laura. I wanted to also mention while Laura was talking, I was putting links into the chat box to many of the resources that she mentioned. Um, I can't remember if they're on that resource list or not. Most I are. did, yeah, um, I did email that resource list to everybody who had registered for the course by noon today. If you did not receive it, be sure to check your spam folder. Sometimes a lot of the emails from my account end up in people's spam folders. So please check there. And then again, if you did not receive it, you can email me. My email is in that chat box, but just again, it's my name. So a first initial shoal at athenslibrary.org. Um, and I'll be more than happy to forward that resource list along to you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, uh, the chat room is very busy and Ashley, do you mind keeping
keeping track of the questions gotcha. because interspersed with the wonderful information yeah. <laughs> are several questions. So yeah, uh, we'll get to them in the Q and A. Well, and if we want, let's real quick address two of those because I'm I'm watching time too because um, I think those will be quick answers um, for our genealogy ladies. Um, so. Elise and Laura, if either of you want to address this question, the first one we got is what is the best way to store papers and other documents? Somebody um, put up the link for the, uh, for the, from the LOC about preservation, which I think is really great. Um, we use it to help with some of our other stuff. So uh, Laura, if you want to address that one. Sure, I'll address that one. Um, since I took a number of preservation courses when working on my specialist degree, there are a lot of great resources like the Library of Congress, the National Archives, um, the Georgia Archives has um, a series on their YouTube channel that they've started on conservation and their workshops where they're talking what they're doing. Now, some of this stuff is not practical for the home owner you know, to do, but it tells you the things to be aware of when you're handling your stuff. White gloves, you know, people think you've got to handle everything with white gloves. Photographs, yes. Everything else, you lose the ability to really feel and you often tear paper when you're doing um, gloves. They're one of my favorite places to order boxes and stuff from is uh, Conservation Resources International, and I'll put that link in later, because um, y'all can save chat at the end of this. There are three dots you can click where it has the name of whoever the chat's addressed to. There are three dots over there, and there's a way to save chat. So at the end of this, you can save to your computer everything that's in the chat. So I just want y'all to be aware of that so y'all don't freak out trying to take things down and miss something since we're going fast. Um, just because something says archival does not mean it's archival. To be truly archival, it has to meet certain standards from ANSI and from ISO. So if it doesn't meet those standards, it's not. And there are a lot of things on the market that you'll see in stores and stuff that say archival or acid free. Well, acid free means it's acid free when it's manufactured. It doesn't mean it's going to stay acid free. So if it doesn't meet those standards, which they're not going to tell you in most instances, then it's not going to stay acid free. So I'm just saying, you know, look at some of these sites that are from professionals and get accurate information. It's not a quick and dirty answer, unfortunately. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, all right, we'll do more in the Q&A. So uh, let's go now to Meryl Penson, who I believe has a PowerPoint. So thanks. And I'm hoping you all can see it since this is my first time doing PowerPoint on Zoom. So, all right, well, uh, first of all, I'm Frida. I'd like to thank you for the promotion, but I don't have a doctorate. So um, I just want to make that point clear. Um, but uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my family history and my journey. Um, and in researching my family history, I've learned that really my family history is American history from the early founding of the country to the present. As Langston Hughes said, free hands and slave hands, indentured hands, adventurous hands, all these hands made America. My family narrative has helped me have a richer understanding of American history and geography. Now, most of my family members won't make the history books, but they were a part of it. My mother played the piano for Mary McLeod Bethune and Eleanor Roosevelt when she was a child. My father gave a tour of the Howard Religion Library to Eleanor Roosevelt. Chief Anderson of the famed Tuskegee Airmen was the father of my classmate, Charles. My uncle's obituary appears in the same paper as the headline showed Obama had won the nomination for president. 
My DNA results from Ancestry and me show roughly about 60 to 40% between Sub-Saharan Africa and Europe. My father is from Fayette County, Georgia, where his father had farmed, mostly sharecropping and sold vegetables in Atlanta. His mother taught in a one-room church school. As one of the younger siblings, he was able to attend Morehouse College with family support and then went on to Howard University Divinity School in Washington, where he met my mother at church where he was interning. She was a teacher having attended famous Dunbar High School and Miners Teachers College. Her family was from Surrey, Virginia and had moved to Washington. Her father was a painter and maintenance supervisor for the George Washington Inn. Her mother was a homemaker, caterer, and one of the first Blacks to work in the labor department as a statistician. My parents moved to Belle Glade, Florida, where I was born. My mother taught school and worked with my father. We later moved to Tuskegee, Alabama, where my father was a Presbyterian minister and my mother a librarian at Tuskegee. Yes, we do sometimes follow in our parents' footsteps, but not always on purpose. Uh, my parents were always active in the community, particularly in civil and women's rights. Now I got into researching my family history, starting with the Pinson family. Here you see photos of my grandfather and my great grandfather. I never knew them. In 2019, I saw the first photo of my great grandfather through a young family member that I met through ancestry. Over the years, I had attended homecoming at Bethlehem Baptist Church founded by my great grandfather Tucker in 1876, where it seemed everyone there was a cousin and church leadership roles were all held by Pinsons. In 1994, my aunt for whom I am named and my cousin thought, ah, we should have a family reunion along with homecoming. I got a call saying, Meryl, you're the librarian, you do the family history. I thought to myself, hmm, you think I don't spend enough time in the library? But I agreed. Thus my genealogy efforts began. As an academic librarian, I had not studied genealogy methods and sources. However, there were two librarians I worked with who did genealogy work. I asked for their help. Big remember, ask for help. <laughs> they would come in each morning and say, okay, what did you find last night? Did you look here? Did you look there? Did you go here? Did you go there? This was 1994. Sound decks, microfilm were the tools. There were a few CDs and dot matrix printers. Web browsers were just beginning to be introduced. No Google, no Ancestry online. I went to the public library. I visited the Georgia archives, courthouses, called and talked to people and elicited the help of my parents to take photos. As a librarian, my goal has always been to help people find information. So this really did fit right in. I enjoy learning new things and even going down rabbit holes can be rewarding for me. And I like mysteries. I discovered two key things. One, using the census, Sam Penson, father of Tucker, the oldest known ancestor. And two, I discovered by reading books about Fayette and Coweta counties that the Pensons were likely enslaved at the plantation of William Boyd Penson. The home in Coweta, Georgia was still standing. Our family took the Penson name. Some spell it now P-E-N while a few still say P-I-N. The Penson family is probably what many consider as a standard story, enslaved, working on a cotton plantation. However, some work to build the Atlanta West Point Railroad. Current owners of the home welcomed our family for a visit at one of our reunions. Seeing the home and walking the land was very important for many Pensons attending the reunion along with seeing the Bethlehem Baptist Church Cemetery. After slavery, many in the Pinson family sharecropped and lived through the post reconstruction. My grandfather was 10 years old when Sam Hose was lynched. 
only miles from their home in 1899. Some bought land, but it was often terrible land and farming was not productive. Descendants later moved to more urban areas across the country looking for better opportunities. They were a part of the great migration. Some remained in the area. No matter where they were, the church was a key part of the story. Some served in World War II, Vietnam, some became teachers, healthcare providers, preachers, engineers, food service workers, and like all families, there were losses, divorce, addiction, and other challenges. I got lots of information from calling people and then reading more about the events or organizations that may have been referenced in the call. I asked what kept couples together so long. I asked what advice they would give to parents raising children. At each reunion, I provide a family tree chart share background about the process and the shared occupations. I also try to include high school sports to help the teen interest. I bring books, documents, photographs that people can browse. One year, I wrote the family story from Sam's perspective and had a cousin perform it. For our latest reunion, I shared the story of the family that moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma and changed their name. I was able to bring in information about Tulsa as the Black Wall Street and the subsequent Tulsa race riot of 1921. Now newspapers can also turn up some really cool stories. An article in the Atlanta Constitution turned up a pension who helped integrate drag racing in Georgia. Adele Thunder Road Pinson would take one engine out of his car on Friday night, put the racing engine in, race over the weekend and on Sunday night, put the other engine in and go to work Monday morning. I knew Adele from seeing him at homecoming, but I didn't know this story. In a Tennessee newspaper, I found a Thomas Pinson who had proposed on the basketball court following a women's basketball game at the University of Tennessee. I emailed a cousin I had recently met from Tennessee and told her how excited I was and I hope she knew him. It would be great to think I had such a romantic cousin. She responded, that's my brother. Thomas is an engineer. His wife not only excelled in basketball at Tennessee and became an Olympian, but she is the current women's basketball coach at Mississippi State and was one of the speakers in 2020 that asked the Mississippi legislature to change its flag with the Confederate emblem. Many Pinson men were wise enough to marry smart and talented women. My aunt Rosa Merrill would use her Saturdays to call family members so she could be the person that could share what was going on and she would share with me. For a while, my father was the oldest of the Pinsons. He died at 100. He decided he would make friendship cakes to send to family members across the country at Christmas. I believe this was his way of helping to bind the family together. I'm sure some people sent photos and information to me so he would send them a cake. We mailed over 100 cakes each Christmas in his later years. Now, my mother would often talk to me about her family history, but I never paid much attention until she came to live with me following a stroke. Her family was from Virginia. There were probably at least five lines of free blacks. Two ancestors served in the Revolutionary War. These free blacks generally married other free blacks and were generally listed as mulatto. Free blacks were considered the drones and pests of society. Their lives were tormented by slavery too. The Banks family had some of their history told by Henry Louis Gates when he told the story of Wanda Sykes. Yes, she doesn't know she's my relative. Um, but historian Ira Berlin said this was the only case he knew of where it was possible to trace a Black family rooted in freedom from the late 17th century to the present. The Banks line begins with Elizabeth Banks, a white indentured servant and an unnamed slave. My mother's cousin, Marion Patterson, had spent years working on this family tree before it appeared on PBS. 
and she often conferred with my mother and shared her work with the Surrey County Historical Society. Now, my parents didn't throw away stuff. Unfortunately, I have inherited this trait too. In addition to using official documents like census and marriage records, I use letters and photos and put them together in a 100 page book using PowerPoint to tell my mother's story and some of the early family history beyond the family tree. Stories like my, grand, my great grandfather hiding during the Civil War as Union soldiers came through and slaughtered all their chickens and how my great great grandmother papered a room with Confederate money. Unfortunately, I didn't finish the book before my mother died, but I gave these books as Christmas gifts to my siblings, her nephews and my first cousins. Everyone was pleased to have the history and to be able to share with their children. Since I'm still going through things, there might be a supplement. Maybe for the supplement, I will solve this mystery. Census and marriage documents show a William Price being from Maryland. However, I have three letters from his parents, Sam and Matilda, and sister Mary Jane, written from Abbeville in Lafayette County, Mississippi in the 1870s. Our family thought he was from Mississippi. Why the discrepancy? If he is from Mississippi, how did he get to Virginia and meet my great grandmother? How did he decide to move from Goochland, Virginia to Surrey, Virginia and buy a farm there in 1882? I started thinking about names and how they sometimes are reused in families. So I did a Google search on Relview Price, my grandfather's name, just to see what I might find. After all, who names their kid Relview? Do you know any Relbues? Well, I discovered in Google Books a story about a Relview Price and William Faulkner's father, which took place in Oxford, Mississippi, the county seat of Lafayette County, Mississippi, the same county from which the letters came. There has to be a connection. I just have to discover it. I found this photo after my parents were gone. I was stunned <clears throat> that I had never seen it. It was in a folder stamped Copa City Club, Miami Beach, Florida. It was the kind of souvenir photo you get taken at the prom or a club by a professional photographer who develops it and gives it to you at the end of the evening. But now this is my parents at a club. <laughs> but given the way their parents looked, it had to be in the early 50s. But in the 1950s, Miami Beach would have been segregated. So I started digging into some history on the Copa City. I learned that the owner had wanted to book Josephine Baker having seen her act in Cuba. Baker refused because she did not perform for white only audiences. The owner said he would guarantee an integrated audience and did. So January 18th, 1951, Josephine Baker performed at the Copa City. I'm guessing my parents went to be a part of this civil rights act. As I continue to search through family papers, photos, libraries, archives, ancestry, and talk to relatives, who knows what other mysteries I will find and solve. More resources are online every day, and I hope to make a few more more visits to different places as well. But I feel such admiration and awe that my ancestors survived the challenges they did. There was love and persistence, a sense of value of education, community, and spirituality. And I feel a tremendous sense of pride that their work built this country and their descendants continue to add value. Doing this work has been rewarding for me and I believe for other family members. Thank you so much. You really uh, timed that. It was perfect. Uh, so we thank you and we'll continue on. Uh, probably there'll be some Q&A and we will go now to Mary Roberts Bailey, who also has a video presentation. Uh, 
Ms. Bailey, welcome. Are you there? Yes, now I'm, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, it says mute, but I'm unmuted. You're unmuted, yes, ma'am. All right. Um, my presentation will be showing some home movies and uh, some pictures. I have not done much with genealogy. Uh, and so what we're gonna do here is show a few clips from Bailey home movies and a picture. And so Ashley is setting that up right now. And here we see our family camping in Nova Scotia. We always went north because we felt it would be racially um, more welcoming. We were kind of reluctant to camp in places like the South. Here you see me uh, with the children in Nova Scotia. I have picked up something and I have called them to come and look. They are very young. The girls are about three and a half or four and the boys are six and seven. When I asked my son Jay why he thought we went camping, he said it was a poor person's way of having a vacation. And here we are again in Nova Scotia at our campsite. And when we began, we began with a Winnebago of all things. And there is the um, picnic table where we were having, we were eating with some friends. Waiting for Ashley here. And there we have gone further north in Nova Scotia. We're in the area of the Cape Breton Highland, the national park. The children are climbing rocks, wearing leather sole Mary Jane shoes, whatever was I thinking about. And when I also asked my son Jay why he thought we went camping, he said that it was a way for his father to get away from the office and telephones because this was the era of pre-cell phones. And so if you left your office, they couldn't reach you. Here we are on the Cabot Trail. Looking down, there's the Aspie Bay, which goes out to the Atlantic Ocean. You can see it's really a beautiful, beautiful area of the highlands, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. They're eating lunch. Beautiful scenery, as you will see. And during our camping experiences, we didn't see any other people of color ever in all the years we were camping. And yet we were well treated. We never had any problems, but we also chose our campsites very carefully. We tended to use national parks, state parks, or in Canada, provincial parks. And as you can see, they were busy jumping and throwing rocks all the time. Amazing. Here we're getting ready to go and see a tourist attraction. There's an old train, which people could go inside and look at. Here they're getting ready to go into an abandoned coal mine. Again, the old train. We'll be gone for about maybe two weeks at a time. And there's Peggy's Cove, a little hamlet not far from Halifax, Nova Scotia, where they're again climbing rocks, exploring. There is Jack taking a picture. He loved gadgets of all sorts. He loved interesting vehicles. So I'm handling the cam the movie camera and he has taken a picture with a Polaroid camera. Notice the hiking shoes, the red Mary Jane shoes with the leather soles, perfect for climbing rocks. The girls are wearing. Whatever was I thinking to not put them in sneakers. They have very fond memories of Peggy's Cove and those years of camping. 
this is a very special picture that I want to show you. In the center there is my grandmother holding my father who was born in September of 1909. To her right are her two sisters and their children and their spouses behind them. Behind my grandmother is my grandfather, John Roberts. To my grandmother's left is her mother, a nephew, and my great-grandfather, Floyd, and my grandmother's to the right sister-in-law, cousin Shella, I mean, cousin uh, Maud, and she's holding her firstborn child, cousin Shella, who was the one who kept this picture and gave it to me in the late 1990s before she died. The men behind her are my grandmother's uh, brothers. And the man with the hat on was a doctor who had graduated from Meharry Medical College in Nashville, about 70 miles south of Auburn, Kentucky. This was taken in front of my great grandparents' house in Auburn, Kentucky. And the year would have been either 1909 or early 1910. At this point, I wanna tell you a story about my great-grandfather, Floyd. And if I forget and call him grandfather, it really was my great-grandfather. He had been an enslaved person and he was living in the little town of Auburn, Kentucky. He was a blacksmith. So one day he goes to his shop in Auburn, Kentucky and he notices that things are really kind of strange. The bank hasn't opened, the shops haven't opened, and there are no people doing business in the area. But he goes into his blacksmith shop and starts his day, starts the fire. And then after a bit, five horsemen come down the street. This story was told by him to my grandmother, who in turn told the story to my father and my aunt. So I heard this story from both my aunt and my father. The men were wearing long coats and riding the most beautiful horses he said he had ever seen in his life. But he noticed that one horse was having difficulty because it had thrown its shoe. So they come to his blacksmith stand and two of the men ride on, but the man, the horse, which is having difficulty, they stop. He, and so they ask my great grandfather if he can shoe the horse. He says he can. So the owner of the horse comes inside and stands the whole time beside my grand, great grandfather and his horse. The two other companions stand outside the door as if they are standing guard. My great grandfather finishes shoeing the horse. And when he finishes shoeing the horse, he pats my great grandfather on the head and he says, you are a good blacksmith and you do good work. That's my aunt's version of the story. My father's version of the story goes that he pats my great grandfather on the head and says, you are a good darkie and you do very good work. Either way, my great grandfather gets patted on the head. And then this man proceeds to pay him a very generous price for shoeing his horse, a price that would, uh, my great grandfather would not ordinarily have charged for the job. The man takes his horse, his two companions who have been waiting outside, they all head off in the direction of the town of Russellville, Kentucky, the county seat at that time. After a while, one of the persons in the town of Auburn come over to my great grandfather and says to him, do you know who those persons were that rode through town? And he said, no, he did not. He says, they were the James brothers, the notorious Jesse James and Frank James. And he said, the reason why the town was set, shut down was because we had gotten word that they were in the area. So we thought if we didn't open up the bank or open up any shops and kind of laid low, they would just ride through and go on their way to Russellville which is what they did because Russellville was only like 12 miles distance. And they did in fact rob the Russellville bank. 
and the date was 1868. So being a skeptic, I said to my aunt, but how did this person know, this Towns person know that it was really Jesse James and the James brothers? And my aunt, who told me this last night, she said, well, they would have known because the James family lived in the area. So they all knew each other, but my great grandfather would have not known so. So this story evoked in me the story about Jesse James, which apparently happens to be a true story. And the Jamesville and the bank in Russellville was robbed in the year 1868. Now, I'm gonna move on and tell you a story about a camping experience we had as I wind up. Uh, this is a story that all of us tend to remember. And so this home movie evokes that. The story takes place in, um, the story takes place in Maine, in Arcadia National Park, outside the little hamlet of, um, my, my mind is, uh, of the, um, anyway, it takes place in Arcadia, in Arcadia, Maine, Bar Harbor, thank you. So we, by this time, have been camping for several years, and we've become quite skilled at camping. We have sold the Winnebago and we now have a pop-up camper. We now have a tent that Jack and I are sleeping in. The children are in the pop-up camper. And we have also added to our uh, entourage a screen tent, which is called the food tent. It has a canopy top and the sides are screened and you zip it to get in and out. We also have these Coleman chests. And Coleman chests are designed with two revelation, revolutions so you can turn them to prevent animals from getting in. The day ends, the campfire is put out, everybody goes to bed, Jack and I are in the tent, the children are in the pop-up camper. And later on, we hear this awful noise. I mean, snarling and growling. I mean, you know, some animals are really having a terrible, terrible fight. But I'm thinking, well, the children are in the pop-up camper. It's off the ground. Everybody is safe, so it's okay. Finally, the noise ends. But then Jack and I hear the scratching on our tent. And we're thinking, oh, dear, it's come for us. What should we do? So while we're there in our sleeping bags, shaking with fear, we hear Devorah's little voice saying, Mom, Dad, wake up. The raccoons have gotten into our food tent and they've eaten Stephanie's birthday cake. Well, we climb out of our tent, we go outside and there's Stephanie boohooing. Oh, the raccoons have eaten my birthday cake. The raccoons have eaten my birthday cake. And we go inside the tent and it is a mess. Cake crumbs, icing everywhere. Jack's favorite apple pie, which he dearly loved had been gouged out. But it was very clear that, that raccoons preferred the cake to the apple pie. That was dried spaghetti noodles. That was bread. I mean, it was just absolutely horrible. So we clean up the mess as best we can. We comfort Stephanie. We say to her, okay, go to bed. And tomorrow we will go into Bar Harbor and we will find you another birthday cake. We had brought the birthday cake from New Jersey. So after breakfast the next morning, we go into Bar Harbor, which was then and probably still is an art colony. I mean, that was a shop that made and sold tofu on the premises. That was a shop that sold granola. There were all kinds of arts and crafts. That was not a bakery that sold a birthday cake with goo and gunk on it like she had had. So finally, after going up and down the street, we decided that we could only do a pound cake. I bought some whipped cream and we went back to the campsite and that night we put blueberries on it and that was the best we could do. When you camp, you learn to be flexible. This, these movie clips and this picture of my family make me realize that part of the reason why Jack took these things, he liked gadgets, but he also had no picture of himself as a child. His mother died when he was an infant. They lived in rural South Georgia. There were no cameras. So his earliest picture was when he was a teenager. And so I suspect that in addition to his love for gadgets, he wanted to preserve something for his own family because it had not been possible to do it for him. My mother told the story that when she was a child, she was born in 1910 also, 1909 also, 
that there were traveling photographers who go around the countryside asking people if they wanted their pictures taken. And for a fee, they would take your picture. And if you didn't have proper clothing, they oftentimes had clothing in their trunks and suitcases that they would lend you to put on that you would look presentable. And that is what happened with her with one of her pictures that hung in a, in a relative's hallway for a long time. And for many years, I did not know who these two little children were, she and her older brother. And she explained that a photographer had come by their house one day in rural Georgia and taken their pictures and he had put on some of his clothing on them and they were looking absolutely darling. When I became older and could appreciate this picture, I asked the relative who had the picture in her hallway where the picture was. And the picture had just disappeared altogether. No one knew what happened to it. And that was really, truly a tragedy. So- Oh, I'm so sorry to break in on you. I'm finished. Uh, well, the time is up, but uh, I, I, I would let you keep, just keep going. The stories are great. I'm finished. Uh, I'm finished. Huh? I'm, okay. I'm finished. Go, so my, go right ahead. So my point I'm making is that we take photography for granted. So if we have pictures, and documents of our families, they should be treasured because they are very, very special. And uh, I'm lucky that we, I have the, what I have is not a lot, but I'm very grateful. And I'm very grateful for my late husband for taking pictures and movie pictures of our family. So thank you for letting me share this part of what my family has done to preserve memories. Thank you so much. And we had a comment in the chat thanking you also for donating those films to the Brown Media Archives. What you've done is very important. Uh, and I think probably that will be mentioned further later that uh, about collecting these images and making sure they're uh, there for people to study and learn from. May I share how I did that briefly? Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. What happened is that I had been dragging these reels around for like years because my husband died in late 1990. And I didn't know what to do with them. We had put them on disc, but I didn't know what to do with the actual tapes. And I didn't want to just throw them in the trash can. And one day I saw this notice in the Athens Banner Herald saying they wanted to collect home movies from African-American families, preferably Georgians. So I answered the ad and said, I didn't have anything from Georgia because we had lived you know, up north. But they said they would take anything that showed an African-American family in a home movie. And so that's how they happened to be given to the University of Georgia. I had no idea it would be archived in the Peabody collection. So mm -hmm. I'm really honored that this has been done for my family and for other people to see as years go by. Oh, yeah. It's, it's excellent. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to turn over the program to Ashley for us to go through some Q&A. We have a number of questions. We only have a few minutes left, but we'll do as many as we can. Ashley? Yeah, so I got a direct question um, from someone about, um, Miss Bailey, the relative that you had in the photo with the hat, who is the doctor, what was his name? His name was Proctor. Proctor? Yeah, uh huh. Was the yeah. last name his first name? Let me, hold on a second. You know? Okay. Pause. <laughs> There's somebody doing research about African-American doctors. Right. <laughs> Serious. His name would have been uh, Dr. I can hardly read my writing here on this thing here. Something in, in what? I don't know, it was Danny or Sammy or something uh, Proctor. I can't okay. read. Okay. And you said he went to school where? Meharry College. Meharry? Yeah, which was in Nashville, okay. Tennessee. Okay, perfect. Um, we had a question too about, and some of you may all be able to contribute to this depending upon your experience. Um, what are the pros and cons of doing the genetic DNA testing? Well, I would just share that I haven't done a lot with that. Um, I have, um, one of the things that was always interesting at the family reunions, everybody wants to know, well, what does the DNA say? And I'm like, well, have you had the DNA test? And the answer is no. 
So then your DNA isn't telling you anything. <laughs> but I will tell you that I did have, when I first started this process, there was a family member, which I guess relates back to something Laura had mentioned, where they in the Freedman Bureau records, there was a, these people were siblings. So Tucker, Jacob, and this Benjamin were siblings, but his he took the name Benjamin Decatur. And so I didn't quite know what to do with Benjamin Decatur since I really couldn't find him much later. So I just sort of stuck him over somewhere. So um, when one of my cousins did the ancestry, I think I got four kits and we and he he was the oldest and I asked him to do it and he did. But so he got results back before some of us actually did ours. But anyway, he, we got a note from a, a young woman who said she was related and they wanted to know how. Well, then it turned out she was a part of this Decatur family, but she's out in California. She's never been to Georgia. And um, she said her family had gotten out to, to um, California on Mormon wagon train. And they were are listed in this thing as some of the first families to be in Riverside, California, first black families in Riverside, California. So again, I, we don't know much more than that between the two of us, but we were connected and in, in through ancestry, but we also had the documentation from the from the Freedmen's Bureau that there, there, there was something else going on. So that's as, that's as much as I can tell you about the, the benefits of DNA. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know from personal experience because I've not done it, nor has met any of my close family members. One of my aunts did, um, but I haven't seen what hers kind of turned up. But the one thing that I've always seen is that don't go into DNA testing with assumptions. Sometimes your assumptions will be overturned. There's, there may be parents not expected happening as well like it is a Pandora's box and to be aware of that and then um, also that um, it will confirm or deny some of the paper history that happens too um, and it may connect some dots for you as well um, but I also think that DNA is not the end-all be-all that you do have to have the paper too um, I think that's been my experience. Laura or Elise, can you speak to that a little bit? Without the paper trail, the DNA doesn't do you much good as far as finding cousins. But it is, and it's more helpful if you'll put a tree on my heritage, put a tree on family search, put a tree on ancestry then you're going to find cousins. DNA, those trees online are cousin bait. And you'll find a lot of cousins that you didn't know you had. Years ago, I read an article by an expert who did a lot of background in statistics and genealogy. And they, they said that conservatively, all of us have 60,000 living cousins. So I'm just saying, some of those are going to know something you don't know. <laughs> it's like overwhelming to hear sometimes. I'm like, oh. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's, somebody has posted in chat too that like DNA, if you're adopted or a foundling, like those, those circumstances, it is extremely beneficial for finding answers and new discoveries and things like that. Um, and because the pool has grown so much just over the last five years, um, oftentimes people immediately are going to find a connection somewhere um, with DNA. So are there any other questions? We also, the other thing it's good for is if you've got a very common surname, it can weed out people with that surname that that don't belong to you, at least the Y DNA can. I'm Williams and Smith. And those are very difficult names. Smith is the most common surname in the US. Williams is the third. And they both seem to have come from 
the UK and those are really common there too. So the DNA is what I'm trying to use to get rid of the ones with the same names that don't belong to me. Yeah, and you mentioned Y DNA. So Y DNA is a little bit different from your typical ancestry genealogy test. The ancestry genealogy and like 23andMe and MyHeritage are considered autosomal DNA tests. Um, so they're going to tell you essentially your connections to about the fifth generation out. The Y DNA test is only people with Y chromosomes, meaning male born, um, can do those. So generally, if you're female, you're doing the research, you your oldest male relative, have them take the test on you know, that surname side to do the research there. And it connects it to, it's a Y DNA test. It connects it to like kind of the, might have, it's, I can't remember the actual science behind it right now. We have a great book in the genial, in the heritage room as well as in our circulating collection that explains all of this. It's by Blaine Bettinger. Um, but uh, the Y chromosome gets you back to that kind of ancestral DNA portion so it can kind of move you further, you know, beyond um, that fifth generation. Um, and then there's mitochondrial DNA tests, which aren't as highly available. Anyway, that do the women's side too. They're just not as helpful from what I've understand or as um, accessible. I want to just add that I think though, the big thing is really, that, that really isn't who your family is. No, exactly. And so in, in terms of understanding, I think who your family is, it's the people that you, you relate to or that have been related to over years. And I think really helping people understand that is better. And I think, you know, the reality is the, um, I, I don't know about the ancestry, but certainly the 23andMe is out to make money and they just are going public this week. And, so, I, I, and I don't mean that it can't be helpful, but I think in the context of us helping people understand who their family members are, it's the library information, the, yeah. the information, you, the stories you collect from your other family members that are the important things to remember. Yeah, and I, I always start, we do our getting started with genealogy classes every other month. Our next one is coming up in March. Um, January, February, March, yes, March. <laughs> on the 18th, they're always on the third Thursday of the month. So where you registered for this, program, you can register for that. But we all, I always start those presentations with family is who you decide who family is through genealogy, you know, whether that's, you know, you have a chosen family or a birth family. And however, it was, however you did desire it to be comprised of, that is your family. And you can do genealogy for every single one of those members, whether you are blood related to them or not. Um, you know, so there is no hard and fast, I don't like to follow the hard and fast rules in genealogy all the time. Um, I think they're a good guide. But then again, like Meryl said, you know, family is who you were raised around and who you have chosen to be your family, so. Well, thank you for that. There have been a number of comments in the chat. Uh, we won't get into all those, but everybody, there are a number of comments on DNA in the chat. So remember what we all learned today because uh, I learned something new about Zoom every time. And so today I learned that those three little dots mean I can save the chat and read it later. So also remember that Ashley has sent out a list of resources that was compiled by our panelists. If you miss out on that for some reason, you can contact her at the athens Clark County Library. And uh, the last thing I want to say before I thank everyone is that we hope that you will join us. Uh, athens Asala has another Black History Month program coming up on the 21st. It is uh, called Lillian Smith um, Ally. Uh, I know I got the title wrong, but we'll be sending out information on this. 
Uh, Lillian Smith is a Georgian who wrote uh, a book, Strange Fruit, uh, about uh, interracial relationships. She did this in the 40s and she took a lot of heat for it, but she was very much a, a civil rights pioneer at that time. So we're going to learn more about her. That's a black, regular black history uh, subject, but this black history program is in keeping with our yearly theme, the African-American family. So uh, without any more, I wish we could stay longer, but we promised you we would be out by 3.30. And we want to express again our deep appreciation to our panelists, Elise Hill, Laura Carter, Meryl Penson, and Mary Roberts Bailey. We want to express again to Ashley in the library. We want to thank all of you for attending, all everybody. And we want to thank our members of the Sala for all that they do. So please, if you have any questions, anything after this, feel free to contact us.